Welcome everyone to the Nebraska Wind and Solar Conference webinar titled, What Do Regional Transmission Organizations Do? A couple of quick housekeeping items to go over. First, your audio will be muted during the session. If you hover over your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a toolbar pop up. This toolbar has the Q&A where you can submit questions for the moderator and speaker to review at the end of the presentation. This session will be recorded and available on the Nebraska Wind and Solar Conference website at www.nebraskawsc.com in the next few days. With that, I'm gonna turn over the session to our moderator today, Joe Francis, former Associate Director, the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy. Joe. Thank you, Anita, I appreciate it. I've been fortunate to hear our presenter, Casey Cathy, talk about regional transmission organizations, our RTOs, in a number of presentations. I've come away from each impressed with Casey's ability to take a very complex system and organization and distill it down into a very understandable manner. Um, I look forward to the presentation today and I encourage you to put questions in the QA box uh, as we go, just fill them in as we go. And with that, Casey, thanks for being with us, and the Zoom is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. So uh, we have kind of a jam-packed um, hour, and uh, but anything that I can't get to, um, I know we have a couple of topics on the upcoming Wind and Solar Conference, um, so we'll cover that uh, there. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so. This hour is mostly about what an RTO does, specifically what SPP does, and I did pick out some specific primary functions that SPP performs. Uh, but I do want to start with a few slides. I'll probably go a little quick um, just to kind of introduce and kind of give a visual on what SPP is, and then we'll go into a deeper dive into some of the functions that we perform. Um, I'd like to start off with our uh, recent, up, recently updated mission statement, which is working together to responsibly and economically keep the lights on today and in the future. Um, it's actually a pretty concise mission statement um, that really encompasses a lot of what SVP does. We don't own anything um, other than the building that I'm currently in. Uh, most of our fees are around salaries and paying uh, the professionals that work for SVP. Um, so we're mostly a servicing agency, and so from an RTO perspective, in a nutshell, uh, is we use economies of scale and networking with SPP's membership. And so from a, a professional and expertise and experience perspective, um, we do simply that in the mission statement as we help our members um, work together to keep the lights on. Uh, so we are based in Little Rock. We have uh, two sites. We have uh, one primary site I'm, I'm actually in, and it's the picture of the building. Um, we're actually over 640 uh, employees on staff um, as of today, um, and we also have a hot, hot backup, which is across the Arkansas River um, in a bed bedroom community called Maumel. Um, that actually houses 24-7 uh, operations as well, and so we have a, a backup facility that's uh, constantly up to date, and um, there's no bringing up a, a secondary site or anything. Um, we have jobs in, in electrical engineering, mostly IT, um, and uh, operation settlements, and it's 24-7. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're not in profit. Um, we are regulated by FERC and NERC, and we are a founding member of NERC. Um, so, SPP has been around uh, for quite some time, um, not at 640 people. It was around a dozen people for many, many years. And uh, over the last probably 15, 20 years, we've, um, we've added many, many functions uh, that our members um, really requested. So um, here is the North America map for um, the, the nine um, RTOs and ISOs. We have a really good working relationship with all of them. Um, if you're not close to the industry, the, the makeup of, the, uh, of North America is, has East, Eastern Interconnection. We're part of the Eastern Interconnection, which actually splits on the west side of SVP. Um, we manage and facilitate seven, uh, eight high voltage DC direct current ties with the Western Interconnection. And all that means is that they operate on a separate frequency, um, both targeting 60 hertz. Uh, and California is the only existing ISO in that area, uh, well, and, and plus uh, Alberta and Canada. 
Um, ERCOT is its own uh, own island, I guess you could say. They're their own interconnection. Um, it's there's uh, I guess pros and cons to that. Um, they can regulate themselves. They're not FERC jurisdictional. Um, but also in terms of emergency situations, they they can't lean on the interconnection such that SPP can um, with the eastern interconnection. Um, here's a, a nice footprint for uh, some of our major functions. The red is our full membership as an RTO, and the yellow is what we're doing um, through contract services and expansion to the West. And so we currently operate a number of functions in the West. Um, on the map, it's showing the reliability coordination function, uh, as well as what we're calling the Western Energy Imbalance Services Market, which was um, previously a market we facilitated in the East. Um, you know, it's a smaller market that's usually just using um, real-time redispatch to optimize resources uh, across um, and generation plants across the, the footprint. Um, we do actually have a couple of other contract services. Uh, one, we are going to be the program operator for what's called the Western Power Pool Western Resource Adequacy Program. And so we are going to facilitate calculating uh, planning reserve margins across to at least 26 participants in the Western interconnection all the way up through Canada, all the way down to Arizona. Um, and that's going to be a really nice, uh, nice benefit for the Western interconnection. This is just a breakdown of the a diversity of membership. We actually have a number of members. Um, we've had some recent, uh, I guess, recent interesting members join, such as Google and Walmart. Um, and so, you know, there are some additional interests from a retail perspective and distributor, distributor energy resource um, areas. Uh, but as you can see, it's a nice breakdown as far as what, the, um, what makes up the membership of SVP. Uh, I like to show this visual. This is our um, high voltage, extra high voltage lines. Um, it doesn't show all of the grid, but it does show that the the red is the 345 kV backbone. So in terms of just the highway byway aspects of moving power across the footprint, uh, we heavily rely on the 345 kV um, standard for our transmission facilitation um, and, and generation across the overall market. And, um, you know, if you if you look at the facilitation of the renewables, it's primarily the wind that SPP has had, um, the increase in build of 345 has been a very key component to uh, being able to facilitate the amount of wind and renewable penetration levels that we have uh, and the records that we have. This is a nice visual on the uh, nameplate capacity that we've seen over time. Um, one thing to just note is the amount of wind uh, is the, in the green area has year over year has increased, and it really is baffling to me um, where we're at now. We actually have 32.5 gigawatts of wind um, registered in the market. Uh, 30.5 is operational, and the remaining will be operational within the next couple of months. Um, that amounts to over 14,000 individual wind turbines that we operate. Um, and so it's it's obviously continuing to increase um, year over year. It seems like every time that uh, you know we we present to Nebraska, you know some of these statistics, it's just uh, baffling how fast and uh, you know increasing that is. Um, one thing to note is we still have a lot of gas and we still have a lot of coal, and that that is something I wanted to talk about this morning uh, because it, it's very important uh, in the transition that we're seeing. This is, this is something that is always asked, what's in the queue? And this is a, a kind of the latest and greatest what's in the queue percentage. And one thing to note is solar is, we don't really have a lot of solar still um, operational. Uh, we do have a number of solar um, generation air connection agreements that are signed and ready to go. So uh, solar is going to be built um, within SPP's footprint. And one thing to note is for the first time this year, solar has exceeded, far exceeded the, the wind amount that's in the queue. So we actually have a good chunk of solar that's in the queue. Another thing to note is the st storage. So all of that storage, that 13.6 gigawatts, uh, is all lithium ion based, all four hour based. Um, it's, we're pretty excited by it um, from an operational and markets perspective. Uh, storage definitely has its place, and and so um, hoping that that a number of those facilities get built. This is a nice slide. It takes a little bit to to kind of visualize and see what what we're showing here. Uh, this is just 2020 
uh, data. So it definitely need to update it for the conference. But um, one thing to note is just the wide range of wind, gas, and coal that actually serves the load. So you can imagine just a visual or animation that it takes all of these resource, uh, resources to, to serve the load, and it depends on what the wind's doing, what the gas prices are doing, what coal's doing, um, the time of the year, the load profile that we're actually trying to serve during a shoulder month versus a winter uh, peaky, peaking month or a summer peaking month. Um, and so you can kind of see the vast uh, range that we actually have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so getting into the nuts and bolts of the functions that SPP performs, I like to start with the NERC functional model, and this is where I'll slow down a little bit. We can start talking about the individual functions that SPP performs. Um, so this is the NERC functional model um, on NERC's website. Uh, I highlighted the reliability service functions, and as you can see, um, SPP is actually all of these within the red circle. So we are the reliability coordinator, we're the registered TSP, and so from a transmission service provider perspective, um, that means that we facilitate a centralized single open access transmission tariff. Um, it's a massive tariff. Uh, don't suggest you read it unless you want to, um, you know, unless you want to go to sleep uh, soundly at night. Um, we are the balancing authority as of 2014. We are the planning coordinator. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. And we are also the market operator. So here's our major uh, services that we list. Facilitation is a big one. That actually is one thing that um, I won't touch on too much today, but it's what differentiates us from most other RTOs and ISOs. We're heavily member driven. Um, we're very consensus based. We actually have a very high track record of once we um, create policy and we file with FERC, uh, there's a lot less litigation because we spend a lot of that time working with members to make sure, and that, it's, it's not to say it doesn't always happen, um, but for the most part, we actually have a pretty good track record with uh, once we file something, um, there's a lot of uh, support from our membership on, on what policies need to happen. Um, reliability coordination, I will touch on that, and balancing authority. Uh, transmission service we is uh, sort of a market that we facilitate, um, but I won't touch on that today. Um, market operations and transmission planning. We also provide training for our members um, as part of the membership agreement. Um, and we actually have a pretty stellar training staff. It's uh, really, I guess it surprises me that they're not so close to some of the things they, um, that we do and they're able to provide such uh, great quality training. Um, reliability coordination. So start off with this. Um, since we don't do any switching, we're not the transmission operator. Um, that is, is left up to, let's say, NPPD or MEAN or, or OPPD, um, Lincoln. The, those are the TOPs within uh, Nebraska. Um, but we are kind of the umbrella uh, from a reliability or resilience perspective. We actually look at um, what if scenarios. So we call it N minus one, N being the state of the system. So it could be that the state of the system already has 40 outages across 14 states. Um, but then what we do is, is we run simulations on what would happen with the 41st contingency. And so we're constantly looking, um, we actually run simulations every two minutes to constantly look at the state of the system. And then we run simulations every six minutes to pull out transmission facilities and then rerun the models to determine what, what if this particular large facility, a substation, you know, breaker, or a transmission line or a transformer, what if that actually tripped or was out of service? Are we able to maintain load and are we able to maintain reliability without, um, you know, I guess overloading another facility, cascading facilities, damaging equipment, that, that sort of thing. And so we constantly coordinate with all of our TOPs um, and our neighbors to be able to ensure reliability. Um, I wanted to show this. This is an older map, as you can see. You can see Nebraska um, was part of the, uh, you know, when Nebraska joined in 2009, we didn't run a consolidated balancing authority. That wasn't until 2014. Um, but I wanted to show this because it helps illustrate a large reason why our integrated market is beneficial to members. Um, so you have to kind of look at the what if situation if an individual utility had to continue to be their individual balancing authority. And so from a BA, from a BA perspective, they actually have to bring enough resources to serve their load in, a, in a, any particular operating day. And so I'm just going to pick on NPBD and you just say, okay, NPBD, 
would have to bring all of their resources necessary to serve their load plus obligations, which is usually exports or net exports, um, to the rest of the footprint or rest of the Eastern interconnection, any uh, transmission service and, and schedules that they have as an obligation. And uh, once we actually consolidated the 16 balancing authorities, uh, when we went to the integrated marketplace, uh, everyone kind of leaned on each other from a unit commitment perspective. And so we didn't necessarily have to turn on all the same generating plants that the individual BAs would, for, would have forced to be um, online. And so we actually noticed the very first day we started the integrated market, anywhere from five to six gigawatts on a day-to-day -day basis was no longer necessary. And so when you think about the overall economy, the scale, and just kind of circling the overall map of CBA, and you, you question, okay, what is the value of the integrated marketplace? The very first thing I would say is taking that additional capacity that was not necessary based on the individual BAs, uh, now it's not necessary because we have a, a, a bigger uh, CBA. So I think that's very important. Um, you know, other than that, the balancing authority is just simply that it's a it's a balancing operation, and we we send out four second signals. Um, we send out dispatch instructions every five minutes, uh, but it primarily is to do just that: balance the generation with the load. We actually have a lot of co uh, coordination and calculations and um, solutions that that we're constantly calculating to basically. I, I kind of um, picture it like a highway with rumble strips and you want to make sure that you're on the highway. You want to make sure you're not damaging another car or you're not running off the highway. And so we have this kind of established area control error, which is the rumble strips on the highway to make sure that you're kind of, you stay on the road. Um, and so you're balancing your generation, your load. Just good time check. Okay. I think I'm doing good. Um, wholesale, wholesale energy market. I think I need to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, what is a market? Uh, you know, in, in general, just from an Econ 101 perspective, it's bringing um, buyers and sellers together, and you're trying to create a business. You're trying to create a business across multiple products. You're trying to create a business that kind of brings everybody together um, to where everyone is interested in providing their product, and those that are interested in buying the product is interested in, you know, getting the least cost and, and, uh, and the and the most optimal service for those particular products. And so that's exactly what the energy, uh, energy market is. The integrated marketplace provides um, a forum to bring all of those buyers and sellers together um, through market participation. So we have different models to um, denote ownership of generation and load. So we have your electrical model, you have your commercial model that kind of overlays it and says, you know, OPBD owns this generator, and Lincoln owns this particular load or is obligated to serve this particular load. And we have all the transmission characteristics that represent the transmission system. And we run simulations. And so similar to, you know, Southwest Airlines has always been used um, previously in business classes for why they're able to, you know, keep their rates down. And it's usually because they buy jet fuel on futures. And so what we, you know, we, we talked about storage a little bit, um, we consume power as Americans a lot higher than anything that we are able to store reasonably, um, even with the technology today. And so it's really a real-time product. It's, it's something that we have to create, and that's part of the VA function. We have to create and we have to consume in near real time. And so what the marketplace does, especially the day ahead market, it tries to simulate a forward market such that if, Lincoln knows their particular load, they could lock in a certain price at a cheaper price um, than being exposed to in real-time pricing, uh, you know, from a scarcity perspective or any kind of uh, price spikes in real time. And so that's part of the justification for the day ahead market is to try to simulate what, um, what the actual operating day is going to look like. And so I mentioned trans transmission service, but I will we'll dive in a little bit more into the day ahead market and the real time balance of market. I did also mention the Weiss market. So these are kind of just the overview of the markets, and we can certainly uh, provide this presentation um, after after today. Um, so some of the market market facts: we have 280 market participants. 
This is misleading. Um, this is posted on our website. We have 5,180 generating resources. This includes dis distributed demand response. I think that's key. Um, I like to use the 800 number. We have about 800 traditional power plants, and that's still a lot uh, for 14 states. Um, and that's nuclear, hydro, wind, lots of wind, lots of gas, um, coal. We still have a, um, a lot of coal. Um, uh, online and operating in our market. And so, um, you know, the 5180, you subtract the 800 and that kind of gives you the amount of demand response. That is increasing and that's pretty exciting because that's a, a, another variable in the generation and load balance and um, controllable and variable load uh, is exciting and um, important for the market. So this kind of gives you an overview of the uh, market settlements, it's billions of dollars that we uh, facilitate in a, a particular operating year. Um, one thing that's kind of exciting is this last heat wave, which has led to a lot of challenges. It's uh, one of these bittersweet kind of moments when operations sees these particular load forecasts. Um, but we did set a peak, um, so the, uh, that's 53 gigs. So we're at 53.2 gigs now um, as of July. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're the market brings sellers and buyers. I mean, if you're an IPP and you're an independent power producer, your your whole business plan is to be able to maximize your overall output and capacity factor, um, then you would be a seller in the market. And then buyers are traditionally load-serving entities, utilities, municipals, uh, power marketers. They're the ones who are actually trying to trade um, to be able to maximize their revenue, but also bring uh, others together so that they're no worse off or hopefully better off um, having facilitated through that power marketer. Um, and then also the market uh, provides locational uh, marginal prices. And so an LMP and a locational marginal price simply means that at every single what we call pricing node, which is any load or generation on our particular transmission system, um, we calculate a price. It's locational because electrically um, the location in North Dakota is very different than electrically in, let's say, Oklahoma City. Um, if there is no congestion on the system, so no uh, transmission congestion, no uh, bottlenecks on moving power from North Dakota to, to Oklahoma, then you would actually see the same LMP at both locations. Um, the marginal piece of it is simple, simply the cost of the next megawatt. So we calculate what the price is and what we publish for those particular marginal prices is the cost it, it, which it would um, take to serve the next megawatt from an overall regional um, load obligation perspective. The products. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, tried to remove the animation, but it didn't work. Um, so the day ahead market I, I mentioned is kind of locking down prices for the day ahead. We run a real-time balancing market, which is a five-minute market looking 10 minutes out in the future, and it redispatches uh, all those generating facilities to serve the load on a five-minute basis. Um, so every five minutes, it's calculating, and it's sending out prices, it's sending out dispatch instructions. And then the balancing authority takes over for kind of the intra five minutes um, until the next solution uh, comes out. It's kind of a true up uh, to get us through till the next uh, RTBM. And then the transmission congestion rights. Now, this could be a whole education session by itself. Um, really, in a nutshell, what TCRs are is a financial instrument to hedge against congestion in the day ahead market. The reason why this is necessary is that entities have, such as, let's say, Nebraska Public Power District, have purchased firm service to kind of denote um, that they want to serve from a, gener a particular generator, let's say G Gerald Gentleman, to their particular load, and they've paid for it. They've paid the service. They've paid to help facilitate the build out of the transmission system. And so then when it comes to uh, converting into an economic and centralized balancing authority, we need a financial instrument to kind of preserve that investment such that NBBD is indifferent to the way in which we optimize the unit commitment and dispatch. And so the TCR is a way in which um, it's also called FTR. It's also called congestion revenue rents. I mean, just depends on the footprint, but it's all kind of the same thing. And it basically allows for some uh, hedging of price differentiation to um, compensate those, re those, those individual entities that have actually invested in the transmission system and own those firm 
physical rights uh, that actually helped build out the system in the first place. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it is recorded, so uh, hopefully you could uh, review that uh, later. That is a pretty complex topic. Uh, it amazes me. We hire some uh, new grads from from college, and sometimes they go in directly in that that team, and uh, and, and they get it. But that's a that's a very complex um, topic. Um, products. So we have energy, which is our primary. I mean, that's energy is is what we all can consume and consider as as when we think about power. Um, operating reserves. Now, this is very important. Regulation up, regulation down, spending, and supplemental. Um, so three of the products are what we call up products, uh, regulation up, spinning, and sub. Spinning is contingency reserve that is online and operational and spinning. Supplemental is typically offline, um, and it is ready to go in, within a 10-minute time frame for contingency reserves in the event of a generation trip. Um, regulation down is a down product, and the reason why I mention that separately is that we actually have to co-optimize all of our products so that, you know, if energy is the most valuable and you don't co-optimize, then generators would never want to bid in or offer in their, pro their, their generation resource for spinning and stuff and regulation up. So we have to co-optimize to make those generators indifferent to whether or not we select them for regulation up or spinning. And these products are, are necessary. They're not as important as energy because that's, that's the primary product that, that the energy industry has. Um, but the operating reserves are absolutely necessary to be able to function reliably. Um, and then congestion rights. So that, that's the product that I mentioned uh, that comes out of the TCR market. Yep, I'm good on time. Um, this is a nice little visual. We talk about operating days. So every single day is an operating day. Um, the day ahead market, this, this kind of example shows that October 7th is a day before operating day, which is OD minus one. It kind of gives you a visual. So let's say today is Wednesday. What we would be doing is operating the day ahead market for tomorrow, but we're also simultaneously operating the real-time balancing market for today, while also the settlements group is settling for OD plus one, two, three, four, they're settling um, the past operating day. So it's this constant rolling um, function. Uh, so marketplace benefits, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I did wanna just mention, and this is, we're kind of proud of it because we, we were able to do some uh, really, I guess, as defendable solutions as you could possibly get um, while trying to assume what utilities would have done had we not had a consolidated balancing authority, unit commitment, software, um, centralized dispatch, uh, et cetera. And it, it is uh, it, a lot of savings. Um, and so that's, it really comes down to a lot of that unit commitment piece. Now there is, there is a good chunk of millions of dollars that come from redispatching across the overall footprint Facilitating wind is a really big piece of it, but it's not just that. Even if all that wind did not get built, um, just optimizing the con conventional resources that we had across 14 states um, and taking off a good chunk of the, the, the resources that would have had, had to be online had we had those individual BAs this year or last year, um, it really it does add up. And so just quickly, uh, this kind of shows based on the FERC uh, state of the market, that we have the cheaper um, price spot prices across the um, across the nation, and I would attribute that to transmission, kind of a trifecta. I would say I'd say it's the transmission that was built, the consolidated BA and, and marketplace, but then also the wind, and, and it's kind of you can't have all the wind that we have without the transmission. You can't really have a lot of the unit commitment savings and wind um, reliably dispatched without the market. So. You kind of need all three, and, and we did have all three over the last, uh, you know, eight years or so. I mentioned day ahead. I think I went through um, RTBM and transmission. Okay, so given the time, I think I'm, I think I'm doing pretty good. So I'm going to spend probably the next 10, 15 minutes, and then we can open up for questions. Um, transmission planning. So this is a quote I've been told that, you know, Ben Franklin may have not said this, uh, but if you Google, they, you know, Google says they said it. Um, I like the quote, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Um, 
you know, most of my background is operations and markets, but I did join planning in 2018. And uh, it is fascinating what we do at, at SPP and, and just kind of planning. It all really comes down to forecast and, and really trying to predict the future, which is, you know, any number number of us probably could predict the future. and We're probably going to all be wrong. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty neat what transmission planning does. So we have to consider um, reliability, obviously. Uh, but we also consider economics, uh, persistent operational issues, and public policy. And so we try to consider all of these things, all of these needs on the transmission system together. So reliability is um, what you would probably immediately consider as transmission planning. So you're, you're kind of running a transmission model. Um, and I can recall in, co in college uh, doing this. So um, I went to LSU and the power systems professor actually had the grid of LSU and said, well, what happens if 2,000 more students, you know, show up and we have to build a dorm here? And, you know, we actually had like a little mini grid and you build it out and you just do the least cost. You try to figure out, okay, uh, we need to build a dorm. We need to facilitate the, these amount of students. This is the amount of load that actually increases on the campus. Um, a transformer overloaded, so now we have to replace that transformer or we have to upgrade it, we have to add another transformer. And so you kind of go through that exercise and you try to figure out what is the best way and you want to give a little bit of buffer because you don't want to just look at the, the amount of students you're projecting. Um, and that's really key. This is You don't want to uh, gold plate the system because of money. But you also want to make sure that you're building it such that you don't have to turn them right around and, and continue to upgrade. Um, when you just facilitate that. And and that's exactly what reliability planning is. Um, it's looking at, at an N minus one or N minus zero perspective. We look at voltage, we look at thermal issues, um, and we work heavily with our members. Our members are key to be able to tell us exactly what the load's gonna look like. Um, and so what we do is we facilitate something called the integrated transmission plan. And it, it's an annual process. So every October we come up with a final portfolio. We recommend to the MOTC, our, our full membership committee um, and the board of directors. And um, once the board approves those portfolios, then they become uh, NTC, notice to constructs. And what the ITP does is it looks two, five and 10 years out in the future. The reliability is typically, um, I don't want to say in every case, but it's typically kind of blessed because it is what it is. It's facts based. It's based on um, what the base reliability models are, what the members indicated. It's, it's physics and math, and you just solve the problem. And so sometimes, you know, there might be a better solution, but typically reliability uh, solutions are not disputed as much. Um, economics is quite interesting. Economics is trying to predict what the market is going to look like five and 10 years out in the future. And we actually run multiple futures to try to hedge against risk of making a bad investment. And so that's pretty interesting because we do, I showed you the queue and we have to predict exactly what of that queue is actually going to be built. What does the market look like? What does the load profile look like? And given this industry, the load is changing. You've got electrification, you've got EV, you've got a number of other things that are traditionally not as uh, volatile or variable. And so now, um, you know, it begs the question that you shouldn't not do economic planning because that's putting a lot of, uh, a lot of costs, potential, a lot, potentially a lot of costs on the load. So you need to be able to predict what it's going to be, but you have to kind of hedge between what could be reasonable versus what you know, maybe is more of an aggressive future. And so we, again, work with our members um, heavily to be able to come up with kind of an optimized look at what economics will look like uh, five and 10 years in the future. Public policy is typically renewable portfolio standards at the state level. There are some discussions around using utilities and member public policies to determine whether or not we need to um, better future-proof the transmission grid. That has not gone through the full stakeholder process yet, but that is in discussion. Um, persistent operational issues. This is something that's pretty interesting because you, you look at the history of operations and you look recently and you want to you want to determine whether or not that operational issue, there's operational issues all the time that just don't show up in the planning model. And typically they won't ever show up in ops again because it was just a unique situation. But the ones that are persistent you know, every single fall, it's this particular line, or we have voltage issues in this particular city. 
then we need to look at it, especially if the planning model doesn't show it. And so we have that as part of our transmission solution. It takes a while to build transmission. Um, there's land rights issues, right of way issues, there's um, states, there's, you know, all sorts of uh, challenges associated. Just, just the build itself um, takes a while. Um, and so that's another reason why transmission planning is extremely important because we have to make sure that we're kind of predicting far enough out to be ready when the transmission facility is actually needed. Um, and so this kind of gives you an overview of, you know, a planning study on a rolling basis, then you kind of add the TO selection process. Now, this is something um, to, in order to facilitate FERC orders competitive bid process, which I would say is fairly successful within SVP. We've had at least six um, competitive projects and we're probably gonna have a seventh um, coming up here. And uh, in general, it has led to some savings on the load side. Um, but for the most part, uh, most of our transmission that, that is built uh, does not go through that process. Um, even so, it still takes a while, you know, two to six years. I think, you know, if you add all this up reasonably, it is three and a half to, to maybe eight years to, to actually build the facility. So we need to make sure that we're predicting that five to 10 year time frame in, in a reasonable manner. Um, so th this gives you kind of a visual of uh, future assumptions. This was a couple of ITPs ago, but it just kind of gives you an, an idea or a visual on some of the things that we look at. We look at, you know, what, what possibly could retire. Again, we work with members. Um, there's a waiver process. We don't automatically uh, remove a, a coal plant from the model, for instance, but we want to make sure that we're working heavily with the members to have the most accurate predictions of what resources will actually be there in the particular study year we're looking at. Um, and then you have the energy storage. You know, we, we have a little bit of batteries, very small amount of batteries right now uh, in our market. Um, but again, there's, there's a lot in our queue. And so what amount is going to be built? And that does translate into a, a change in dispatch patterns. So if we're too aggressive in the amount of storage that we predict in our economic models, then that can totally change the overall economic needs that we're actually predicting um, to build for. So we have to make sure that we're balanced in, in exactly what we're uh, doing. I wanna say wind, um, we, you know, I, I mentioned the numbers, we're, we're exceeding our projections year over year. Um, our, we're exceeding our aggressive, I would say our emerging technologies future in wind uh, 10 years out, we're exceeding that in, in a roughly two to three years. Um, we have gotten uh, a lot better, though. Our members are, are um, you know, paying attention, and we are updating our, our overall numbers on, you know, how much wind we really do have and that we're, you know, will reasonably, reasonably get built. Um, so economic needs, I think I need to hurry up a little bit. Economic needs. Um, so average shadow price. So shadow price is, is a mathematical calculation to basically say, you know, let's say the shadow price is $2,000 for a particular constraint on our system. And what that means is that says that it had we had relaxed that rating, that facility that was constrained by one megawatt, then we would have saved $2,000 for that particular market solution. And so what we do is we simulate the market, um, as I mentioned, those futures, and we simulate 8760 hours for a particular study year and we calculate what the constraints are um, for their average shadow price. And then we multiply that times the amount of hours that was bound in the, in the study. So where, where you hit a limit, basically you're trying to maximize the, the cheaper generation, but at some point you, you're hitting a limit um, to serve the load. And so you calculate what that cost is and we come up with a congestion score. We stack those congestion scores and this is what really makes it fall out on where we should pay attention in our, in our economic solutions to fix, uh, because ultimately the, it, it boils down to where is the consistent congestion such that we really need to justify a transmission facility um, to, to kind of future-proof those corridors. And this gives you an example of what that is. Um, this was the 2020 ITP. So we finished this up at the end of 2020. Um, very interesting, challenging year, the first year of the pandemic and, and us all scrambling. I'm sure you all did too, um, but we did pull it off and, and we came up with a uh, portfolio. This was before, this was the need. So you can kind of see Nebraska and you can kind of see the yellow and the red um, where 
we needed more we more, needed more transmission kind of from mid Kansas into south uh, I guess southeast Kansas. You can kind of see there there's a need where we needed more transmission down into New, uh, New Mexico. There was a load pocket kind of in North Dakota that red. Um, and then if I if I move with the portfolio we developed and justified. It basically eliminated all of the yellow and red in, in uh, North Dakota, and it heavily minimized um, what was happening in Oklahoma and Kansas. So this kind of gives you an idea. This is a lot of rolled up data, um, and so it doesn't really seem, you know, it seems kind of subtle, um, but it is on the order of millions of dollars saved. And so what we do just to ju justify and make sure that we're making a solid judgment for the portfolio is we run additional sensitivities once we've come up with the transmission facilities we believe um, address the economic needs we're predicting and then we it's kind of a tornado type of decision chart where we look at okay what if the wind doesn't show up what if retirements don't happen as fast what if the gas you know this is a big this is a big deal now um, with gas prices the way, the way they are what if you have a low gas what if you have a high gas what, what do the benefits look like and then we calculate what the costs are and as long as um, the bar kind of above this one billion right here is it, you know not exceeding too much then you kind of have your overall risk profile and range from a business decision perspective um, I, I really like this chart because it kind of helps identify and understand that we we are kind of just shaking the trees on on individual economic portfolios to make sure that we're making the right decision okay i'm about to wrap it up um, one a couple of slides on resource adequacy and then we can open it up to some questions. Um, so resource adequacy is one of our uh, hot topics in the industry. Um, it really comes down to a lot of the things that we've indicated to the um, well really the Nebraska Wind and Solar Conference. Um, we are we currently value um, attributes of some of the resources we have and it really comes down to ramp. I would say ramp and energy. Wind is an extremely valuable resource, uh, but sometimes in, in uh, SVP, the wind doesn't blow. And so what do we use to back it up? We, we use currently uh, coal and gas. And so from a resource adequacy, adequacy perspective, um, I really like this analogy on, on the right. It's you know kind of talking about a baseball team and you look at the capacity. Well, the capacity is all the members of, um, able to play. And then you look at the energy. Well, those are the members that, those are the players that are actually on the field playing the game um, actively at that particular time. And then you look at the planning reserve margin. Well, the reserve margin are those uh, able bodies that are on the bench ready to play um, and at any moment's notice and when the coach needs them. Um, that's kind of a good analogy from a PRM perspective. So when we talk about reserve margin, um, even though we have a lot of gas, we have a lot of coal, we have a lot of wind, um, you look at the installed capacity of SVP, it far exceeds even our recent peak. There are times where we are capacity short. And so we have to constantly look and run um, many, many thousands of sim simulations to come up with, um, to come up with what risk profile we actually need. And so this is, this is kind of a nice visual. It, um, it takes a minute to, to, to kind of determine, but I'm going I'm to point your eyes to the bottom right. So we have demand. You, you have a lot of di different demand profiles within SPP. You, um, you also have your overall generation, which is your supply profile. And what we try to do is we come up with an industry. Uh, the industry standard is um, one day in 10 or 0.1 days in one year. And so if you're running a one-year simulation, what we're looking for is 2.4 hours or a 2.4 hour event where you're losing load. And so we call it loss of load expectation. And what we try to do is determine what amount of supply do we actually need to simulate to ensure, it's really an insurance policy, to ensure that we're reasonably um, accurate with, because you can't, again, you can't build generation overnight. And so we have to make sure that all the load responsible entities have enough um, either firm purchases or generation capacity uh, at their disposal to be able to uh, serve the load. And so this is a very hot topic given the winter storm URI, given the variable energy resources that we have, um, the trajectories that we have. If pretty much the only thing that's being built in our queue is uh, gas, I mean, uh, sorry, wind, solar, and, and storage, 
they have capacity value, but it's a little bit different. I mean, sun obviously um, doesn't shine at night. So solar has a very um, limiting capacity once once we're talking about the night load profile. That's, a, I guess, a pretty good example I like to use. Um, and, and so we still have to have a certain resource mix to be able to uh, fuel that. And so resource adequacy is a really important um, topic, and we are constantly making um, policy. And I believe really the next probably five years or so, we're going to see a lot of activity in this particular uh, business function um, to kind of put more requirements and possibly uh, more incentives to be able to bring certain attributes uh, of generation to the table. And so as gas or coal retires, uh, maybe additional technologies can be brought to the table to kind of help facilitate and keep that LOLE in, um, kind of in the guardrails. So, Joe, I, yeah, I know that, I went that, through a lot, but I just wanted to save some time. That's that's perfect, Casey. Thank you so much. And and I think this all points to uh, really the wisdom of having folks attend the, the wind and solar conference that's coming up. I encourage you to take a look at that. One other thing to think about, I think, is for participants to take a look at the SPP website. It really contains a lot of information in an understandable manner and kind of helps bring, bring bring folks up to speed on this. We got a couple of questions here and I'd, I'd like to con combine a couple of them. Um, we've noticed more congestion lately. Do you have thoughts on why or plans to address this congestion? And related to that, is how did the queue for new transmission get so backed up and what can be done to speed up the process? Okay. Um, yeah, so congestion is something uh, very interesting because it, as soon as you build, uh, let's say an economic facility, then it just loads up to the next, that's really the state of the market. So the, the whole market um, purpose is to try to optimize the system. And as long as we're kind of doing our job, there's there's that balance between congestion on the system versus kind of overbuilding the system. Um, but uh, there's kind of a disconnect right now between um, GI, uh, the generation air connection process, the transmission planning process. Um, and what we're attempting to do is we have something called the consolidated planning process. They're actually meeting right now um, with members to kind of develop a more centralized integrate we, we call it integrated transmission plan but it's even i guess an itp 2.0 which would include the gi process to be, better align and optimize the transmission system to um i guess get underneath the the economic congestion that, that we're seeing in real time now recently um, we're seeing a lot more coal usage because gas prices are, are through the roof um they're they're over nine dollars i checked last night it was nine nine dollars and forty cents um, and so that's changing dispatch patterns that are largely different than what we're predicting. That throws kind of a wrench into whether or not, um, you know, our members really help help us to determine whether or not we need to make some modifications in our futures assumptions. Um, and, but then also uh, it's been really hot. And so if you kind of just look at July and August, um, we've had a lot more load as well. And so that also leads to some congestion. From a queue perspective, um, I would say, We've had three Q reform uh, policies over probably the last 15 years. And I would say this last Q reform to get us on track um, is scheduled to get us back on track and, and kind of out of the backlog uh, by the end of 2024. So, you know, roughly two, two and a half years from now. Um, it is, we've only had one data point from, I guess, two data points from our last two uh, Q studies and uh, by all indications, our last reform is working. And so what that is, there, there's a number of policy changes, but effectively it's increasing financial obligations, it's increasing site control, it's trying to get rid of um, some speculative uh, GI requests, which I, I kind of use that term loosely. It's not necessarily speculative, uh, but trying to, um, I guess, weed out some of those resources that are on the cusp of their particular business case or business plan. The reason why we got into the queue uh, backlog is primarily because the queue uh, design was never designed for this wholesale uh, regional fuel mix change. I mean, it was designed in the late 90s, early 2000s, at least for SPP, and it was mostly for a gas peaker. You know, your, your load's going up and you want to, you know, add a, a gas peaker. And so, 
it was never designed for this. And so we have to kind of cluster all of these wind and solar projects together in a particular power flow model. And without getting all the nuts and bolts, um, when someone, uh, I guess, pulls out of the queue process, it changes the results. And so it, it requires a lot of rework. And so, um, but right now we're, we're still confident that we're, we're gonna get out of that backlog. Okay, uh, next question. Do projects in the queue for development have weighted factors? That is, might gas facilities weigh higher or move faster than wind or solar since they are more critical for reliability? Not currently. Um, we are contemplating, this is, this is almost, almost a queue jumping uh, type of uh, topic. And some people cringe when, when they hear the word, you know, the phrase queue jumping. Um, but there is discussion around in the, in the stakeholder forum on round, around whether or not that is necessary. Um, some of the things, and, and it kind of depends. I mean, our, our market monitoring unit wants to develop uh, kind of an availability market, which would incentivize, uh, let's say, gas plants to, to be built. Um, or other types of resources to be built that would be controllable from a ramping, rampable capacity perspective. Um, but right now we, we don't, it's, it's just queue based. And so it's, it's, it's first come first serve and then they get um, lumped into a particular cluster study um, and, and it, regardless of fuel type. In that regard, would there be, a, you know, you talk about your stakeholder process is that some place that you would go to determine whether you are going to allow queue jumping? You would rely heavily on the stakeholders to determine that? Yes, um, you know, SPPs, we tend to only intervene in these kind of things and have kind of a harder stance if we think that, you know, reliability is at risk. Um, but right now, as it stands, um, the trajectory, the policies that we're creating and the market incentives we're, we're building and the PRM, you know, we're raising the planning reserve margin. Um, SVP is really just facilitating those discussions at the, um, we, we call it the Generation Air Connection User Forum. Um, that's where some of those discussions start and then it'll go through the working group process um, if that's something that the membership is willing to. And of course, it's not just the members, it's also FERC. So whatever policies we, we come up with um, definitely has to make sure that, that it passes, um, you know, FERC. And so whatever we come up with has, still has to be fair and equitable or um, not unduly discriminatory. Okay. Um, what is the interplay, if any, between RTOs such as SPP and MISO, M-I-S-O? Do they share markets, work together in transmission planning and interconnection? Yes. Yeah, so we so we work heavily. We have over 240 tie lines with MISO. And so we have worked very heavily with MISO. In fact, we have an afternoon call with MISO about uh, generation retirement process this afternoon. So we, we definitely work with them. Um, we, we don't, um, we have what's called a market to market, which is basically a congestion management um, optimization when uh, we have congestion um, on the system and they have kind of a, a, a decent amount of flow, like basically their generation patterns are, are such that they're a part of the problem um, and vice versa. So if, if SVP's market is causing harm on, on their system, then we have an optimization. It's not just a settlement. It actually optimizes the two, uh, what we call SCEDs, the Security Constrained Economic Dispatch. And it's pretty powerful when you talk about all of MISO generation and all of SVP generation. So it's pretty interesting to see when, when it actually operates and optimizes. Transmission planning, so that's real time. And, but in transmission planning, we do uh, what's called a, a coordinated system plan. And so we do that annually now. It used to be every three years. Um, we, we, I guess, are only required to do it every three years. But right now we've been doing it every single year. We do a uh, coordinated system plan in lockstep with what we call the ITP. They call the STEP, MISO STEP. Um, and so we we basically, uh, well, MTEP, I'm sorry, my, MISO transmission expansion plan, the MTEP. And so we oper operate and optimize to that. Now to that end, we have not built an interregional project with MISO at this point, but we do have uh, something very promising right north of Nebraska, uh, which is called the JTIQ, it's a joint targeted interconnection queue, which optimizes queue positions across SPP and MISO. And it's um, helped facilitate 
seven transmission projects that we've identified, um, and we're right now working on cost allocation policy for that. Okay, we have maybe time for one real quick one, and this probably isn't a, a quick one, but we'll give it a shot. How does SPP look to fill the void for a Western RTO while also trying to navigate the WI-EI seam? Yeah, so we, we actually have, um, so um, we have interest from RTO West parties to have a uh, full um, RTO membership across the seam, across the Western Air, uh, Interconnection, Eastern Interconnection. As, as of, um, I, I want to say yesterday, maybe Monday, the latest is that um, we're on target for the full signature and commitment in the February, uh, March timeframe. It's a two-year project. So we're looking to have a full functional um, RTO probably early 2025. Um, and so we are looking to navigate that. It will encompass three of the seven uh, direct current um, tie lines with the Western Air Connection. Um, we're kind of seeing this as, you know, again, we're nonprofit, but in, in terms of just economies of scale, we do see a, a lot of benefit, even for the East, when we actually expand for the West. And it's not just reducing overall our, our administrative fee, it's also sharing renewables across the DC ties or even. Um, looking at additional transmission planning opportunities. One study we've been looking at is whether or not we can even bypass the DC ties and join the interconnection. Um, that's probably for a whole no another topic, and it's quite interesting um, because the stability of the system has changed and it is no longer unstable uh, the way it was in the 60s um, and, and the reason why we actually have two interconnects. All right. We better wrap it up. Casey, thank you so much. And so many of the topics that you covered today could be their own session. Um, the website will contain Casey's slides. So give it a couple of days and, and you can get on and get the, get the slides that Casey has presented today. And with that, I'll return it to Anita. Thanks, Joe. Um, yes, as Joe said, we will have everything up on our website here in the next couple days. All attendees will get an email letting them know when we have it posted. And then just as a reminder, the Nebraska Wind and Solar Conference is coming up October 25th and 26th at the Marriott Cornhusker here in Lincoln. Uh, registration information can be found at our website, www.nebraskawsc.com. Thank you all for your time today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.